There's an old baseball story that goes something like this. Before the 1947 baseball season began, Red Sox owner Tom Yockey met with Yankees owner Dan Topping. The two men drank together and agreed on a deal. Joe DiMaggio would go to the Red Sox for Ted Williams. Legend has it that Yaki thought better of the trade the next morning and demanded that Yogi Berra be included. That made the whole thing fall apart. Well, I don't know if that story is true or not. I mean, it's got all of the markings of a baseball tall tale. However, as we're going to see today, if that story was true, then Tom was really wise to nix the deal. It certainly wasn't going to help the Red Sox. We can see the problem if we take a look at their stats up to that point. DiMaggio had just come back from the war. His 1946 season wasn't bad, but it also was nowhere near where he had been before the war. Check out in particular his drop in war. I know that most of you don't care much for war. You know that I'm not a huge fan of it. However, it really does come in handy when we talk about things like this. Ted Williams, meanwhile, was an OPS machine and was the current MVP. His war output at that time was simply amazing, signs that he was truly one of the greatest players in the history of the game. There are some who say that the Splendid Splinter was the best player in the history of baseball, actually. Many of us think that he was at least the greatest hitter of all time, and it's really hard to argue against that point. Modern metrics in particular just love Williams. In fact, his hitting philosophy, especially his approach to taking walks and being patient, has become more famous, more widespread, and more relevant as the years have gone by. And in this experiment, Williams looks like an absolute monster. I set it up like this. I started a new game in 1936 with OOTP. I chose 1936 because this was DiMaggio's rookie season and because Ted Williams played for San Diego in the PCL that year. I decided to use real minor leagues since Williams was in the minors. I also used a five-year recalculation basis and had rookies directly imported to their real-life teams. I kept everything else more or less on the default settings. I then jumped in and assigned Williams to the Yankees and DiMaggio to the Red Sox. It was a one-for-one -one exchange. As you can see, Williams, who was only 17, went straight to the minor leagues. DiMaggio, on the other hand, stayed with the Red Sox. The idea here was to do just a really quick trade and let the computer sort out the rest. If the computer wanted to put them in the minors, I let the computer put them in the minors. I also let the computer manage all the rosters and I didn't really pay much attention to what happened in real life. Basically, I wanted the managers to have the freedom to piece together the teams as needed based upon what they had. I didn't intervene at all. I played through the game one season at a time and recorded my progress as I went along. What happened here really surprised me. Now, if you're familiar with OOTP, you know that Ted Williams is always an incredible player in OOTP. I mean, if he comes up in your random debut league, you need to do whatever it is you can to get him. But I never thought he would be this dominant. Actually, in the beginning, it looked like the Red Sox got the better end of the bargain. Jolton Joe started off by hitting extremely well, for example, this towering home run in Washington, D.C. DiMaggio hit 388 in Boston his rookie year, adding in 47 home runs and 182 RBIs for the Triple Crown. He also managed 13.2 wins above replacement, which is unheard of for a rookie. For the sake of comparison, here's a list of the all-time single-season WAR leaders according to Baseball Reference. A WAR of 13.2 for a rookie is simply unheard of. Well, as you can imagine, this kind of result early on had me a little worried about OTP's accuracy. I mean, yeah, DiMaggio was a great player in the mid-1930s, and sure, Fenway Park was only going to help him out, but this felt a little bit over the top. The Red Sox finished 1936 only a game out of first place, just losing out to the Detroit Tigers. Ted Williams, meanwhile, spent most of his season in single A. He was the number one prospect in the country. As you can imagine, the Red Sox were favored to win the American League in 1937. 
Remember, they also had Jimmy Fox and Lefty Grove in addition to DiMaggio. And that's just what happened. They won the pennant. In 1937, the Red Sox finished in first place, beating out none other than the Yankees by a single game. Joe DiMaggio was the hero of the World Series that year, winning the sixth game with this seventh inning triple with the bases loaded. DiMaggio hit 407 during that World Series, easily winning the World Series MVP. That capped off another incredible season. DiMaggio led the league with a 366 batting average, came close to another triple crown, and put up 11.2 war. Williams, meanwhile, spent the season with the Yankees, though he was mostly used as a pinch hitter. There were signs of things to come, though. Check this one out. And this one. Okay, I need to note something here. OOTP has problems with replicating the attendance in this era. You might have noticed that that clip from the OOTP 1937 World Series game wasn't a sellout. It wasn't even close. I mentioned this problem on the official forums. For some reason in this OOTP project, World Series attendance in the 1930s never really exceeded 23,000 for any individual game. That includes Yankee Stadium. Now, you can go back in the history books and look at how many people went to those games. The truth is that people did attend ball games in the Great Depression era. It's not that everybody in the country was just impoverished and had no money at all. Anyway, this is one of the immersion-breaking things in OTP that really drives me nuts. The 1938 Red Sox looked extremely strong. And so did the 1938 Yankees. In the end, the Yankees managed to win the pennant by a two-game margin. DiMaggio led the league in war again with a 9.3 performance, but his offensive production tailed off slightly. Williams, meanwhile, was a part-time starter with a lot of pinch-hitting chances. In the first game of the World Series that year, Williams broke a 4-4 tie in the top of the seventh with this triple. And the Yankees rolled on to a sweep of the Chicago Cubs. Now, it was around this time that I discovered that I had made a mistake. I was using both 5-Year Recalculation and OOTP's Development Engine. You might remember I did a video on that before. It's a combination that works really well. However, I forgot to turn off Retire According to History. Unfortunately, that meant that Lou Gehrig retired in 1939. And that really hampered the Yankees quite a bit. Cleveland won the American League pennant that year by a comfortable margin. Williams had had his first full-time season and led the league with a 369 batting average. DiMaggio, meanwhile, led the league in war for the fourth year in a row, putting up a ridiculous 11.5 rating. DiMaggio repeated the feat in 1940 with another impressive war performance. But Ted Williams was just a little bit better, and the Yankees won the pennant this time around. In the seventh game of the World Series of Forbes Field, Williams did this. Anyway, I think you get the picture. DiMaggio played well, yeah, but Williams was simply a beast. The 1942 Boston Red Sox won the American League pennant. DiMaggio had an off year, however. He was hampered by injuries, which honestly is pretty realistic. Joe was able to hit this towering home run to tie the fourth game of the World Series that year. But the New York Giants won that game in 11 innings thanks to this monster two-run home run by Bob Johnson. In 
In the end, the Giants won the World Series. Well, believe it or not, that was the last time that the Red Sox went to the World Series in this project. For whatever reason, the computer was completely unable to get offensive players that could replace Jimmy Fox and help out Joe, uh, Joe DiMaggio. We'll skip ahead now to DiMaggio's retirement in 1955. Joe had a great career, as you can see here. He led the majors in home runs four different seasons and wound up with 515 total home runs. His career war total was 119.9 in 20 seasons of play. He averaged seven wins above replacement per season. 119.9 would have put him between Grover Cleveland Alexander and, ironically enough, Ted Williams in real life. Notice, however, that his best seasons all came at the beginning of his career. When you look at his real life stats, you'll notice that the same thing happened. Here's a look at the 1951 Red Sox in this simulation. You can see here that something is wrong. The top four stars were all over 30 years old and were clearly eating up a lot of salary. By 1954, DiMaggio was down to two and a half stars in OTP, which is not a good thing. Boston played horribly that year, finishing in last place. I guess there might have been a question as to whether DiMaggio was really Hall of Fame worthy, but he was inducted in 1961. Now the cool thing is that OTP tells you what share of the vote he got. DiMaggio got a mere 98.2% of the vote on his first ballot. And seriously, there was really never any question of Joe going to the Hall of Fame, not after a career like that. However, in the end, I have to say that I'm a bit disappointed with his career. I really think I could have probably put together a better team for Joe if I had been actively managing the Red Sox roster. But what do you think? Williams, however, was a different story. This home run blast in Game 2 of the 1950 World Series in Boston gave the Yankees a 12-10 win. It was Ted's second homer of the game. The Yankees absolutely tore up the American League in this project. They battled with Cleveland and Detroit in the 1940s, but they then took over in the 1950s. They won the American League pennant every single year from 1950 to 1961. Seriously, I created a monster. I think a big part of the problem was combining having rookies go on to their real life teams with the reserve clause. That meant that the Yankees got Yogi Berra and Mickey Mantle to play alongside Ted Williams and never had any reason to get rid of any of them. Oh yeah, they also signed Larry Doby when integration came in 1947. I mean, imagine what that outfield looked like. For example, here's what the Yankees looked like at the beginning of the 1952 season. In real life, DiMaggio's injuries forced him into retiring at the end of 1951. As you know, the Yankees still won the 1952 World Series. In contrast, in this replay, the Yankees dominated the American League in 1952, beating out Cleveland by 21 games. And there were more surprises, too. Here are the batting leaders for 1952. Notice that Willie Mays decided to sign for the Boston Braves, not the New York Giants. The Braves also managed to get Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanella. They formed a dynasty, and it was one that didn't make much historic sense, I'm sorry to say. I mean, if the Boston Braves had had a team like that in 1952, they never would have moved to Milwaukee. The Braves won the pennant every year from 1947 to 1955, winning the World Series seven times in that period. The Braves and Yankees met in the World Series just about every year. When the Cubs broke the streak in 1956, they won the National League pennant only by a single game. And the Braves won the pennant again in 1957, of course. There were a few other oddities that I'd like to know. For example, we kind of take for granted that certain players belong to certain teams. Dom DiMaggio started with the independent San Francisco Seals in this project and wound up being sold to the Philadelphia Athletics. That's one of the reasons why the Red Sox were so poor, by the way, they missed Dom. Stan Musial started off with the Williamson Colts in 1937. For some reason, OTP treats that as a Washington Senators affiliate, though that's not right. 
He wound up being traded to the Cincinnati Reds since the Senators wanted to get an aging Babe Herman for some reason. Rogelio Linares started off with the New York Cubans in the Negro Leagues. His contract was purchased by the Detroit Tigers before the color barrier was lifted. Hispanic players like Linares create a problem in this kind of project. Honestly, I'm probably just going to play with integrated uh, leagues from now on when I play through these seasons. It's more interesting that way anyway. The Tigers later decided to trade Hank Greenberg to the Red Sox right before the 1942 season for five younger players. Greenberg probably helped the Red Sox win the American League pennant that season. However, Boston's youth system was devastated as a result. There were probably some other notable deals that I missed. You know, when the Yankees started to dominate season after season, I kind of lost track of what the other teams were doing. Ted Williams finally retired in 1963. He was 44 years old. He wound up with 866 home runs, a 329 career batting average, and a whopping 183.2 war. If that happened in real life, it would have put him slightly above Babe Ruth's war total, according to Baseball Reference. Williams managed to avoid major injuries for most of his career. He only ran into a little bit of trouble in the early 1940s. Ted won nine MVP awards, two World Series MVP awards, and the World Series itself an amazing nine times. He was named to the All-Star team 21 times. In contrast, DiMaggio won three MVP awards, one World Series MVP, one World Series trophy, and went to the All-Star game only 15 times. Well, it's pretty clear that Ted Williams was the winner. Well, like I said at the start, Tom Yawkey really should be happy that he never made that drunken trade. Okay, if you're interested in doing a project like this, I need to give you a little warning. OOTP 25 is still not fully stable. The game crashed on me about eight times when I was doing this project. It particularly struggles in the 1940s when there were a lot of different minor leagues. You might want to consider making your own abbreviated minor league structure. There's no reason to have so many. Or you might even just want to stick only to the major leagues and use some sort of reserve roster or whatever. And like I mentioned before, to make it actually competitive, you might want to consider bringing in free agency a lot earlier. Overall, though, it really was a fun project and I'm planning on doing more. So let me know what you think.